morning again, church. So we are going through a series here, The Last Hours of Jesus. The Last Hours of Jesus, and we've chosen to pick it up uh, from when he left the upper room and uh, became feeling very alone uh, through all the events that came next. We're looking at what the Bible, we're just trying to follow out the Bible. I'm going to go ahead and list out for you the sections of Scripture, if, in case you want to write them down, because we're going to bounce back and forth through these um, in this next period of time. So in the first time, we found that in the Gospel of John, there was really not very much, but uh, now we have all four. So here they are, Matthew 26, 46 to 56, we'll be looking at that. Uh, Mark chapter 14, verses 43 to 53. Luke, our scripture reading that you have on your bulletin there, Luke 22, verse 47 to 53. And it turns out that in the Gospel of John, we have a whole section which is unique uh, that addresses this, and that will be in John 18, verses 2 to 13. So again, the chapters are Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, and John 18. Last week, we were with him in the Garden of Gethsemane, but today we go to the arrest of Jesus. And we'll have a little bit, too, from the Desire of Ages. Well, let's begin. Who comes to arrest Jesus? It's an interesting question. Who would come to arrest him? And there are descriptions from the Gospels that tell us. Matthew describes them as being the chief priests and the elders of the people. Mark identifies three groups by name. He talks of the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Luke doesn't really get into the groups. He just calls them a multitude. Tells you it was a good-sized group there. And then John says that they are the chief priests and Pharisees. So now this group surely was a group with uh, hundreds of at least a few hundred in it, perhaps, a small number, but that's a large number. And don't you think that there were Pharisees and elders and scribes and some from the chief police, chief priests, the temple police, and so on? So this is the what we're told. This is the group that was there. And it's quite interesting because, you see, there are a lot of people involved. There's a strong desire across many groups to put it in modern day language, to cancel, to cancel the ministry of Jesus. And lots of groups have agreed this, this is what we would like to happen. These existing groups, they've domesticated themselves and they like the status quo. They each have their little place in the picture. They have a vested interest in this world. In all these groups, they all think they have something to gain by suppressing Jesus. This is quite interesting if you think about it. Imagine the elders getting together and thinking about this and talking about it and deciding, you know what, it would be better for us if Jesus was dead. The scribes getting together and talking among themselves and saying, you know, for our purposes, the things that we think are important, it sure would be good if we could suppress or kill Jesus. The chief priests getting together and saying, Jesus has got to go, and so on, all the different groups. And all these different groups, including the Pharisees, they all were perhaps met together, met in their group, and they all decided, you know what, Jesus, we just can't have this. He's, he's got to go. And so along the way, they combined their interest, and although they were little, little in agreement on anything else, they were agreed, Jesus is a terrible threat to us, He's got to go. We're going to kill him. Imagine that. The reports state that the group with Judas came. They were equipped with swords, clubs, lanterns, torches, and weapons. All to come for Jesus. Imagine coming to Jesus with weapons. 
But that's what they did. He who could have called in angelic force by the legions. He submitted to an unjust arrest. I just don't think, how can you go after Jesus who has all power? But this is what they're doing. These people are way, way in a strange place. The Gospel of John says that Judas received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees. Matthew and Mark say that Judas came from the chief priests and elders of the people. And uh, Luke is going to focus just immediately on Judas's betrayal. So we're going to work our way through all these pieces. But isn't it interesting that all sinners have a vested interest in putting Jesus out of the way? They're all satisfied in their sins, and they're all very deeply embedded in a world of sin. Jesus has interrupted all that, calling people up to something higher. And so, you know, they really have two choices. We can respond to the call and come up higher, or we can get a big stick and go out after Jesus in the dark take him away and we can put him up on that cross and of course they chose part B we're not going to change we're going to remove the messenger we're going to destroy him Jesus must be ended so you know what it's not from a position of strength that they're operating these people are afraid out of their minds They've seen Jesus these past years. They've seen him healing people. They've seen the crowds listening. These people, all of them, you know, they sound kind of strong coming along with their torches and their weapons, but these people, these leaders are afraid out of their minds. They can hardly think. They're so afraid. And so they're in desperation They think that if they do not act, they're going to lose what little tiny sandcastle kingdoms they have. And they're not willing to lose their little sandcastle kingdoms, their little tiny bit of influence they do have with the people. So Jesus must die. Now these accounts here in our Gospels we're looking at, the accounts of that night, they place emphasis on different things. Some people think this is a weakness. You know, oh, the Bible message, the Bible authors don't speak together. They all say something a little bit different. So this is a, a testimony against the authenticity of Scripture. I don't think that's true. I don't think it's a true at all. In fact, each person was inspired and led by the Holy Spirit. Friend, if we had a Pastor Doug Batchelor come in here and preach, and then I took... Uh, took 10 of you off into the side room and said, each one of you spend the next 10 minutes writing out what happened. You would all give your perspective. You would write it out. And I'm sure you would tell us the truth from your perspective, but I don't think all 10 would be the same. Do you? You'd emphasize different things, different things that were said by the preacher. And so the Holy Spirit is leading these people. And if you notice, each one of these four Gospels has a little bit different approach. These are kind of classically understood. For example, Matthew. Matthew has his own approach. He tends to focus on Jesus as king. And Matthew talks a lot about the fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus is the Messiah coming. He's the fulfillment of prophecy. He's the royal king. And also in Matthew, you have a lot of the teachings of Jesus. Mark. What does Mark talk about? A lot of the same pieces overlap, but Mark is going to emphasize Jesus as a man of action. In fact, everything in Mark is an action. If you look in Mark, uh, one of his favorite Greek words is ephthus, immediately. In the Gospel of Mark, everything happens immediately. Jesus went here and immediately this happened. Jesus went here and immediately that happened. That's Mark. Also, by the way, although Mark's the shortest Gospel, he has the highest amount of detail. So if there's something that Mark talks about, Luke and the different ones talk about it, if you want the most detail, flip over to Mark because he usually says more, even though he's, he's got less, but he says more. Luke, 
Luke is a physician. Luke also says, I wanted to tell you about, you know, the, I want to put this in historical order. And so Luke is going to give you a lot of the emphasis on, he's going to fill in some of the spaces that aren't in some of the other ones, and he's going to tell you about what did happen historically. Luke has his perspective, and he'll also tell us a lot about miracles. John. What about the Gospel of John? Those first three are called the Synoptic Gospels. That's what the theologians and scholars call them. John is the fourth gospel. It's a little bit different. And John has his different emphases. The big emphasis of the gospel of John, and we'll see it actually in just a moment, is that what? Jesus is God. You cannot listen to John's gospel and leave the room saying, well, we're not sure. Jesus is God. And so miraculous manifestations of divine power are going to receive John's attention. So all these different writers are going to tell you from their perspective, as the Holy Spirit, mind you, leads them to give emphasis. So let's look now at these things highlighted by our gospel writers. Matthew and Mark are going to emphasize, in the section we're looking at, they're going to emphasize the betrayal of Judas. Luke is going to emphasize the baseness and the duplicity of this group that's controlled by powers of darkness. John is going to focus on Jesus and the strengthening angel and Jesus' voluntary submission to drinking the cup that his father has given him to drink. And all these are important points and the Holy Spirit led the minds of these Bible writers to these things that are emphasized. So let's begin now. John's account, the Gospel of John, this is John 18 if you want to turn there. John's account includes a part of what happened that's really not spoken of in the other accounts. So let's begin there because in sequence, I believe what John is talking about happened right at the beginning. So we're going to John 18 and verse 2. If you want to follow along. At the sound of the approaching mob, Jesus steps forward. And according to the gospel of John, he speaks to them. This is unique. It doesn't, it's not talked about in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. It just means that John is going to tell us this part. So Jesus, the group's there, the mob comes in, and Jesus steps out in the front. And he begins the conversation. Who are you seeking? Jesus asks the mob the question. Usually the mob asks first, don't they? But Jesus walks to the mob. He says, who are you seeking? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus replies, I am. Now, your Bibles probably say that he said, I am he. If you look in italics there, it'll say he, because he is added by the translators. The literal Greek of the New Testament says that, Greek, that Jesus said, Ego e me. Ego is I in Greek. And e me is the Greek verb of being. I am. I exist. And Jesus said to them, you know, who are you seeking? Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said, I am. And I am he is good too. It's Jesus is saying, well, that's me. So that works. But it's interesting, this I am, this I am business, because it reminds us of a scene long before. In fact, if you want to flip to Exodus chapter 3, Moses and God are having a conversation. And God is telling Moses, I have a job for you and you're not going to like it very much. And Moses is arguing about it and trying to say, well, you know, you could pick somebody else. But that's not going to fly though. So after this conversation goes on, uh, finally, Moses has a pretty good question at verse 13. So we'll read it here. Then Moses said to God, When I am come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? That's a pretty good question Moses has, isn't it? When they say, Oh, you're, we're going to be delivered from the Egyptians. Well, that's pretty rich. How's that going to happen? Who's the God that sent you again? 
And so Moses says, this is what they're going to ask. What should I tell them? And then we have verse 14. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, who sent me to you? I am has sent me to you. I am. Who is God? God is I am. And just as it is in the Greek, this is Hebrew, or it, but in the Greek, I exist, I am, I am being. How does God describe himself? Who is he? What is he? And the best that God, God looking at, you know, the brains he gave you and me and Moses, and the best way he could describe who he was so that the elders of Israel would understand, God put it this way. It sounds kind of cryptic. I am who I am. I exist that I exist. The self-existent one. I have sent Moses to you. We're going to deliver you. That's God's answer. I am is the way that God chose to describe himself to Moses in Israel. I exist that I exist. And it might sound strange or cryptic or mystical, but... Is there a better explanation? Is there a better way to name it? And I don't think there must be. Do you? Have you got a better name for God than the one God gives us? Now, by the way, you might remember a verse in the New Testament that helps us also with this. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4. The lesson that's being talked about, the lessons that were learned as God's people went through the wilderness. And then we read this in verse 4. All drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So who was it that interacted with Israel in the desert? Jesus was. I am that I am did. The pre-incarnate Christ interacted with them in the desert. He was the rock that followed them. The Gospel of John has Jesus over and over again claiming that I am. Do you remember that? This is kind of a, a central piece of the way the Gospel of John is organized. Let me give you some of these. This is, this is uh, critical, built into John. Listen to this. I am the bread of life. John 6, 35, verse 48 and 51. Jesus also said, I am the light of the world. John 8, 12. John 9, 5. I am the door of the sheep, John 10, verse 7. I am the good shepherd, John 10, verse 14. Are you, are you beginning to kind of catch this? I am, I am, I am. I am the son of God, John 10, 36. I am the resurrection and the life, John 11, 25. I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. I am the true vine, John 15, 1. And in verse 5, he says, I am the vine. And we could add a lot more of this to this. Uh, we could add, I am the teacher and Lord, John 13, 13. I am Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth John 18, 6. I am, I am a king, John 18, 37. And right here at John 18, 5, at his arrest, right here at his arrest, Jesus, they're going to arrest him for blasphemy, for claiming that he's God. And what could be more ironic than Jesus who comes back and says, oh yeah, you're looking for God? You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth? I am. Okay. You've come to the right place. They're coming to arrest and crucify Jesus for blasphemy, for claiming to be the Son of God, and he is and at his very arrest, he demonstrates it to be true. So here at the beginning of his arrest, Jesus demonstrates his deity. Now there's something that happens here in uh, the Gospel of John, and you might have noticed it. When Jesus steps forward and they say, who, who are you after? We're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus says, I am. What happens? In the Gospel of John, they all fall to the ground suddenly. Well, was that just a puff of wind going by? 
And if you read actually in Ellen White in the book, The Desire of Ages, in the chapter where she talks about this, this, this event, and this is around six, almost 700, 696 or somewhere in there, Ellen White actually tells us what happened. And apparently she was shown this. Do you remember last Sabbath we talked about the angel? Jesus prayed, please remove this cup from me. And the father didn't do it. But what he did do was he sent an angel to strengthen Jesus. Do you remember that? Well, that angel was still there. And so when Jesus stood up and he said, oh, you're looking for him? He says, well, that's me. I am. At that moment, the angel stepped aside and there was a flash of divine brilliance. And it wasn't a puff of wind that knocked everybody down. It wasn't because somebody sneezed. It was because the brightness of that angel shocked them and, and knocked them all to the ground. That's what happened, says Ellen White. Now remember, these guys are there as high and mighty officials, right? They're all there to arrest Jesus. So they must have got up real quick, you know, and kind of straightened their stuff and brushed the dust off, you know, and stood up just as tall as they could stand. And Jesus said again, who are you looking for? I'm looking for Jesus of Nazareth. Well, that's me. So anyway, that's, I think, what happened there. Jesus demonstrates his deity. But then there's something that happens next. So let's go to the next phase of what happens, the next part of this sequence. I want to look with you about Judas's kiss, the kiss of Judas. John doesn't talk a lot really about it at all, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. And this seems to have been what happened next. Now, of course, this is not a kiss of passion. It's not a, a sexual kiss. This is a uh, cultural thing. It was a close social greeting. When men and men and women and women met each other, the two parties would come and they would hug each other and then kiss on the one cheek and then on the other. And that's the way it was. Enemies never greeted uh, with the kiss, but family and people who were close to each other, they would greet each other with a kiss. So Judas comes to Jesus. Judas approaches him. And he lays hold of Jesus, and then he comes and he kisses Jesus up on the cheek. And when we compare the accounts, the sequence of what happens when, it, it seems to me that Jesus spoke to Judas after the kiss. And what did he say? Matthew 26, 50, Jesus says to Judas, friend, why have you come? Did Jesus know why he had come? And yet... He called him friend. That's how Jesus wants to relate to his enemies. Even though Judas is there as part of the mob that would destroy and murder Jesus, Jesus says to Judas, friend, why have you come? That's something I like about God is that he wants to be my friend. When they nailed him to the cross, and we'll come to that, but do you remember that? What did Jesus say? Forgive them. They, as the nails are going through his body, he's saying, forgive them. They don't know. They don't understand. Luke 22, verse 48, you heard it in our scripture reading. And that has Jesus saying to him, Judas, question, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? What a question. Now this was to be a sign to the mob that Jesus was the one they were looking for. Remember, it's night. They're there by torchlight. Everybody's kind of stirred up. They're excited. They're, they're afraid, probably afraid of their shadows. If I could go back in time, I'd be tempted to get up behind him and go, boo! But that probably wouldn't be wise. The night and torchlight would make it harder, and so they had this worked out. There was going to be a concrete action by Judas, a last public seal of betrayal. It was designed by the elders to secure Judas irrevocably on the side of the establishment. I mean, he would be publicly betraying Jesus by kissing him that way. And then they come to arrest him, you know. They come to take him by force. 
And so that was what was worked out, and it was designed to secure Judas on their side. In Ellen White's chapter addressing this event in her book, The Desire of Ages, Judas comes and he gives this kiss while he's acting like he's on Jesus' side. He presents himself as being in sympathy with Jesus. It's pretty grim stuff. Well, of course, we all know Judas, Judas never gave Jesus his whole heart, and Jesus wasn't fooled. Always there was a part of Judas that he withheld from Jesus. And now Judas betrays Jesus very coldly. What an awful night in Judas's life. He had gone too far. It was too late for him. Remember when he went out from the upper room? It said in the Gospel of John, he went out and it was night. It was too late. Judas had made his decision. Thankfully, hopefully, most likely, none of us have gone too far on the wrong side. We can still draw close to Jesus and be forgiven, even now. Friends, Judas' kiss is a warning to us. Even when we are close to Jesus, we can be betraying him. Even when we are, you know, high in the work of God, maybe we serve as a deacon or a deaconess or an elder or a pastor or a conference president or whatever, there is enough brokenness in us to betray him. You may not know what your weaknesses are, but let me tell you, the devils have a list, and they know you. We shouldn't fear it. We should realize that it is not in ourselves to, to be on. We need God's strength. We need his help. We need his presence. Otherwise, we would revert to our bad self. And our bad self is bad enough to betray Jesus or anybody else that we love. We need the grace of God to be upon us. We can, in an apparent act of affection and intimacy, betray him. So what are our motives and do we know ourselves? A question for us. The kiss of Judas causes us to think about our own hearts. But let's keep moving because now there's something that happens and it begins to happen very quickly. And I guess we could call it the melee. Emboldened by Judas's touch, the mob now moves forward. They're coming, they're surrounding Jesus. And they move to physically take Jesus. Things are, are just happening instantly. And Peter, Peter draws his sword and he begins swinging. And he cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant, Malchus. Now, Peter wasn't a swordsman of any kind, but he knew how to handle a fisherman's blade. Now, by the way, what is it that's right below the ear? What's right below the ear? The carotid artery is right below the ear. Friend, if you're around power tools, I'm guessing, I'm guessing you guard your carotid artery. You don't put it under the, under the table saw, do you? I don't think Peter was aiming for the ear. Do you? Peter was swinging, and he, uh, he knocked the ear off. But here's the problem. Jesus did not walk into the garden to resist arrest. Could have. But he, he's not leading his disciples there to prevent, to pre help him, to protect him, to prevent him from being taken by, by using bladed weapons. That's not the plan. This was a misapprehension on the part of the disciples. Friends, how quickly are we prepared to take up arms, to fight battles as the world fights battles, to enter into political or military struggles? Rather, friends, God is calling us to be a people apart. We are a people who give our highest fealty to a kingdom of an entirely different order. We are pilgrims and strangers. We are passing through here. This melee was a mistake. And although they already had Jesus bound, if you read the different accounts, it seems like they already kind of had his hands bound. Jesus instantly does the Houdini. He gets loose and he says, just let me do this. And he reaches and what does he do? 
Malchus. Malchus is going to kill him. If he, he's going to be part of this group to kill Jesus, Jesus takes him and he, he gives medical first aid to Malchus. I mean, it's more than first aid. He restored Malchus's ear. And the rest of Malchus's life, what a thing to be thinking, to realize that his hearing, and don't you think he probably had, you know, I don't know what, if for vision, what, perfect vision is 2020. I don't know what perfect hearing is, but my guess, I'm just guessing with you, I'm guessing that Malchus had like 2020 hearing after that or whatever, I don't know how to say it. But, and all the rest of his life, Malchus, because what does God want to do? He wants us to hear the word of God and be transformed by it. His word will not turn, come return empty if we'll just hear it. And so the rest of his life, Malchus, whenever he would hear something, he had to be thinking, Jesus, Jesus put my ear back on. I wonder, I wonder if later in his life, if Malchus, or maybe even starting this night, I wonder if he began to listen to the word of God. I wonder if he'll be in the kingdom. I don't know. I'm glad that Jesus put his ear back on. Jesus wants all of our ears to be open wide, big and fat, big wide, big ears, right? So we can hear the word of God. John 18, 11. Now Jesus has something to say to Peter. Jesus got out his sword, you know, and we did this business, and now the ear's back on. Jesus has something to say. John 18, 11. Put your sword into its sheath. He's talking to Peter. Put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my Father has given me? In Matthew, verse Chapter 26, verses 52 to 54. I think Matthew gives us a little bit more of what was said. Here's what it says. Put your sword in its place. This is verse 52. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen this way? So Jesus says, all who take the sword will perish with the sword. We need to be careful that our activities and our very approaches can meet the requirements of heaven. Sometimes we are going to have opportunities, even within the work, the work of God, where human methods could be employed in an attempt maybe to achieve something good. And we'll be faced with a temptation to use human methods to do God's work. And I understand from Jesus, we need to beware that temptation. In our church, there are sometimes issues about this and that, a worship issue or a woman's ordination or different issues. Someone's going to come along and you'll, we'll say, you know what, that's wrong. And they're using human methods to try to get their way in the church. And you know what, what is the first thing you're, you tend to do? You all did it when you were a kid. Well, he started it. And so we have a way of kind of being justified. Well, he did it the wrong way, so I'm justified in doing it the wrong way. No. No, we need to keep to higher principles. We need to do things in the spiritual way. And even when we can recognize that we could maybe do something and maybe it would have this wonderful big, apparently would have this wonderful big effect, if it's by human methods, it's wrong. We need to use divine methods. All who take the sword will perish by the sword. We must remain principled, even when people seem like they're gaining on the wrong side. We must be principled. God will bless it. Slow down. Trust in Jesus. Don't lose your pathway because the other side did something ridiculous. Be principled. Be a Christian. Jesus is telling Peter that, that he can have whatever force he needs. Jesus can take whatever force he needs. He can get it from the Father whenever he asks for it, but he's not asking for it. What happened when one angel showed his face to the Assyrian army? One angel. 100,000 are dead. 100,000 troops. One angel. Jesus could, says, he says here, I've got legions of angels if I want them. All I've got to do is say, send them, and they'll be there. 
Jesus isn't sending for those angels. Because how then could the scriptures be fulfilled? This is a time in the plan of God when Jesus, Jesus must follow through. He must, if he chooses, he must die for the sins of the world. Peter, with wrong methods, is putting that all into jeopardy. Jews, Jesus, Peter, rather, is acting unilaterally. And Jesus stops his defenders and they finish. The, the, the captors come and they go ahead and they take Jesus and they bind, his, they bind him again. And now they're going to bind him to take him away. Now there's two more pieces we want to look at in the sequence here. I think we should think a little bit, maybe there's three. We should think about Jesus' question. Remember what we talked about in John 18, 11? Jesus had a question. Shall I not drink the cup which my father gave me? Now, you remember the cup from that episode in the Garden of Gethsemane, the same place here, but last week, right? Jesus had asked his father, if it were possible, take the cup away from him. Remember the terms. Father and son had already agreed on a plan whereby justice could be served and the lost who were willing to receive gifts from God could be saved. Jesus had asked to have that cup, that terrible suffering experience, in the garden last week, he asked for that experience to be withdrawn. I want out of the contract. But he qualified it. If it's possible, if it's possible for these humans to be saved with me doing it a different way, then withdraw this, take this cup away. And what was the response of the father? Nothing. Zero. Silence. All his life, Jesus had prayed to the Father and received answers. Absolute silence. But then the angel comes. Remember the angel? And he strengthens Jesus, and Jesus understands. The cup is not being withdrawn. The Father is telling me there's no other way. He's going to strengthen me to endure. And Jesus understood that's the answer. The Father is saying, no, I'm not taking the cup away. And so here he says... Shall I not drink the cup which my father gave me? Jesus is going to go ahead and go all the way through. If there were any other way for humans to be saved, then Jesus would not go through with this awful, awful, indescribably soul-wrenching suffering. But there was no other way. And so Jesus, trusting in the Father... Understood the answer. And so Jesus, knowing this to be his father's will, Jesus was determined at any price. At any price, he would trust the father. And at any price, he would die for man. He would die for you and me. At any price. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the father gave to Jesus the cup of suffering. Already, Jesus had suffered immeasurably in the garden. But now this cup would not be drained until Jesus actually dies on the cross. That's still coming. This was the cup his father had given him, and he was now determined. He's going to drink the cup. He's going to drink all of it. All of it. What is it that inspires Jesus to do this? It is love. It is love, love for the lost, love for humans, love for humans in all our folly and even in our rebellion. But we're still able to be restored to full humanity. Jesus dies to give us life. He sacrifices himself to enable our own hearts to be changed. Jesus drinks the cup for you. Well, let's go on back to this item is from Luke the next thing that happens Luke records one more statement Luke 22 verse 52 and 53 one more statement from Jesus that should make us think and here's what Jesus says have you come out 
as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you didn't try to seize me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. That's not in Matthew or Mark or John. Luke gave us that very interesting item. That's an enormous rebuke. Enormous. When Jesus was in the temple every day, they didn't try to take him. When he was teaching them daily in the temple, they didn't try to take him. They tried to argue a few times, but pretty soon they found out that was a that was like a law. Every single time they lost. They kind of hang in the sides there, just kind of being grumpy that Jesus was there. They learned not to, not, to, uh, not to have a discussion with him, with their principles. This is the hour of betrayal. This is the hour of injustice, untruth, force, farce, and murder. That's the hour. This is the hour of the power of darkness. In this act is bound up what? Their intention to murder Jesus. This mob isn't there to, you know, give him a reprimand. They're not there to give him a 30-day suspension. They're going to take him away. And they're going to put him on the cross if they're at all allowed to do that. They're going to kill him. This is a crowd of murder, people murder hungry murders. Untruth cannot win against truth. Selfishness cannot win against unselfishness. Darkness cannot prevail against light. Always then, what? Force must be used. There's always the barrel of a gun at the end of the arguments provided by liars. Always. Always at the end they must enforce their reality by murder and death in taking life. That's what's at the end of the, of the, the thing. Unreality takes life away. The mystery of iniquity takes life away. It cannot give, but it can, as far as it's permitted, it can take it. Murder, force, evil. The power of darkness is the power to suppress truth, to use force and coerce and take and squeeze and pressure and choke. It is inhuman, demonic. Satan was a murderer from the beginning. No, first he was Lucifer, but when he decided that I'm going to do it my way, that was when he became a devil. That's when he became a murderer. It's going to be my reality against God's reality. At the end of that, that whole track is what? Murder. John 8, 44, Satan was a murderer from the beginning. The only recourse error has in the end is to murder. That's the path. Once you're on the path of error and your pride refuses to let you back off from your mistake, you're on a path to murder. At the end of that road is murder. And you'd be the murderer. Error, once it's clear to the holder of error, must be surrendered, or you can just keep embracing it, but only at the cost of becoming a murderer. The end of lies and error and pride is always murder. Jesus, Jesus would die for us, all guilty as we had become for choosing rebellion, sinning against God, the Father would execute against Jesus his full wrath against our sin. The wages of sin is death. But devils and wicked men, they don't have any plan like that. Their plan just ends in murder. They hope to end Jesus forever. They hope to use all of his fallen humanity against him to torture him until at the last moment he trades God's love for self-preservation. That's the devil's hope. It's got to be, or we're done, said the devils. That's the plan. It's the one and only way they can destroy God. That's, this is the hour of the power of darkness. This is the ultimate demonic attempt. If they fail at the cross, everything after that will be retreating action on their part sour grapes, a last frenzy of destruction before they themselves are ended. ended. Either they're going to cancel Jesus or they're going to wind up getting canceled themselves. It's all on the line. The demons are uh, 
disagreeable and grumpy group, but I think they were pretty much united. Do you remember how the Pharisees and the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes, and they were all united against Jesus? Why? Because they had a vested interest in ending Jesus. The demons have that vested interest. The demons led them to have that interest, and now there they are surrounding Jesus. So here's a group of men. They're under the control of demons, doing the bidding of the demons. What an incredible, awful sight. And you say, well, how could it get any worse? But there's one last piece in our sequence today. And yes, it gets worse. It's one final element in this scene. So the disciples are dazed and confused. They weren't clear about why it had happened in this way, what was going on. This wasn't in their plan. Jesus being arrested and taken away by the, the authorities. They couldn't understand all that. And Matthew and Mark record what happened at that moment. Matthew 26, verse 56. Then all the disciples, how many of them? All the disciples forsook him and didn't walk away whistling. They forsook him and fled. They ran for their lives. But I believe that Ellen White was also shown this event in vision, and she has a little something she tells us in The Desire of Ages. Page 697. She saw this and lis listened to what happened, because we have a little bit more detail here. Here we go. The disciples, talking about the disciples, the disciples were terrified as they saw Jesus permit himself to be taken and bound. They were offended that he should suffer this humiliation to himself and them. They could not understand his conduct and they blamed him for submitting to the mob. Now listen to this sentence. In their indignation and fear, Peter proposed that they save themselves. Following this suggestion, they all forsook him and fled. And now you know where the idea came from. Peter, Peter. It was Peter's idea. Peter, Mr. Brave Sword Guy. Scatter to the four winds. If we don't get out of here now, we're done for. Every man for himself. So Jesus, he's bound now, he's left alone with the mob, and they begin to escort Jesus back into the city. You know, this must have been a bitter moment. It must have added, don't you think, to the suffering of Jesus? These are his guys. I mean, this is, they're all there, all 12, but you know, Judas, he knew Judas was, was off. But there's 11, there's 11 which... Could have somehow worked out different here, but, he, but no. Not only had they misunderstood his kingdom by bringing out and employing weapons, but to save themselves, they run into the night. They're confused and afraid, and did you notice what they, that they were still driven by self? Let me read the sentence to you again. This is the clue. Here it is. They were offended that he... They, the disciples, were offended that he, Jesus, would suffer this humiliation to himself, to Jesus, and them. They're mad at Jesus because Jesus was humiliated, and they were humiliated by Jesus being taken. They're thinking about themselves. Jesus is going straight through to the cross to die for them, for their sins, so they can have eternal life, and they're, they're like, well, he caused us to be humiliated. Jesus is giving his life for them, but they're worried about somehow being humiliated. Friends, 
we need to let go of our own concerns. This is not about whether we feel humiliated or not. This is about Jesus dying to save us. So this must have been a bitter, bitter, bitter moment for Jesus. But he's going to go on through anyway. And poor Peter, I think we're going to see some more about Peter next week. What can we say? Today we're looking at the last hours of Jesus. Tonight, or at least in the night we're looking at this morning, the arrest of Jesus. There are questions for you and me. Do we know what our own motives are? Are we on Jesus' side? Are we people who could pull a sword out and fight for Jesus and then, and then 61 seconds later, we're running through the forest to save our own skin? Is that who we are? I think that the grace of God is sufficient for these things, but on our own, that's not. We've got to have Jesus. Well, friends, Jesus was arrested so that the scriptures could be fulfilled. One angel, he could have sent for one angel and been all over but he voluntarily submitted so they could take him away and the torture will all continue and he'll be heading towards the cross more and more but that's that's another week friends I don't want us to feel bad about this but I want us to know we need Jesus we cannot trust ourselves the most heroic guy we saw today, not Jesus, but except for Jesus, Mr. Sword Guy. We're going to have to conclude this sermon with him running through the woods, afraid for his little life. We don't know ourselves too well. May God help us to know ourselves better and better and to be on the side of Jesus.